So in that type of world where technology can increasingly be used to surveil and control populations, that there's this technology that can actually also enable them. And I think we can envision two different futures depending on which path ends up winning. The long-term vision that some people have had that your banks will settle in Bitcoin, all your trade will be settled in Bitcoin. Do you, do you see that as something that could happen? Well, I think the, the longer it goes, the less outlandish that sort of scenario gets. I mean, if you were to call that when Bitcoin is 500, it looks sillier than when you call it when Bitcoin's at 50,000, for example. Uh, you know, at, as roughly a trillion dollar asset, it's becoming meaningful on the macro scale. Uh, I think if Bitcoin continues to get adoption and continues to grow in market capitalization and liquidity, um, it becomes increasingly useful as a reserve asset, right? So we, you start with the kind of the, the fringe countries, the ones that are either kicked out of the dollar-based system or they're already dollarized and they want to, you know, like, like El Salvador, for example, they want to do this kind of this move to attract all the tourists, to attract the capital, uh, lower remittance costs, b- b- a bunch of reasons, even even just, you know, put their name on the global stage in a way that that it wasn't a year ago. Um, so there's those incentives. But basically, the bigger it gets, the more useful Bitcoin becomes as a reserve asset. It becomes another way for Russia, for example, to, to make themselves more sanction resistant. And again, I mean, you might not always agree with the countries that, that might use it, but you, if you understand their own incentives, you can see why they might become interested in that technology. And so I do think that the, the bigger it grows, essentially this uncensorable public ledger that's quite secure is attractive for individuals, companies, and nation states in many cases. And of course, it has to get big enough to attract those larger pools before they, they start taking it seriously. It feels like there's an incentive for everyone to use it, but for, for different reasons. Absolutely. I mean, basically, <laughs> going literally from cypherpunks to uh, you know unsavory types of, uh, of either countries or individuals, or just people in Turkey that want to protect their purchasing power, uh, or people in the United States that want to protect their purchasing power. Basically, there's there's... One of the common problems worldwide is how to store your value, how to store your wealth, right? Especially in this era where we're essentially in financial oppression. So interest rates are below the inflation rate, you know, usually in, in terms of the official inflation rate, let alone whatever the quote unquote real inflation rate is. Uh, you're not really keeping up with, with the creation of currency. Um, and so there's natural people are monetizing all sorts of things. They're monetizing art more than they used to. They're monetizing their homes. So you have you have home value to income ratios going up dramatically. You're monetizing stocks where you say, I don't even know what the stocks do. I just want to shove money into an index fund because it's better than cash. So we monetize all these other assets. And so the world pretty much has a store of value problem. And it becomes worse for emerging markets that don't have access to a lot of, you know, they, you know, you can't buy fine art. You can't, you know, real estate is trickier. You can't buy the S&P 500. And so Bitcoin is one that they can all hold on their mobile phone. And then, of course, you have countries like Iran that say, okay, we want to be able to buy things if we want to. And we, there's this permissionless payment rail that we could use. So there, there's all sort of, any pretty much any actor out there uh, can use Bitcoin for a purpose. What a time to be alive, Lynn. Um, you know, it's not all good. There's a lot of scary things happening. But we're, we're living in this world of you know, potential currency wars or, or actual currency wars between major superpowers. But at the same time, any individual can exit the system because... 13 years ago, somebody launched a protocol that's become uh, this decentralized currency of the world. It's, if, if you did explain this to somebody 15 years ago, if you did explain Bitcoin, said, yeah, but we're going to have a new currency that's going to come along. We don't know who the creator is going to be. It's going to be completely decentralized. It'll be the fastest growing currency in the world, and uh, the governments can't switch it off. People have thought you're bucking mad. <laughs> and it's, it's funny because if you look at old quotes, there are people that like were Bitcoiners before that Bitcoin existed. Like if you look at Hayek, for example, yep. he's like the only way yeah. that, that you're gonna have good money again is if someone can introduce a sly, you know, roundabout way to separate money from state. He's basically describing Bitcoin before it existed. Uh, again, you know, Henry Ford talked about a currency of energy and, and yep. that gold was too centralized. Sovereign individual. A lot of people just you know discuss this thing, and so it's it's kind of remarkable that it happened. And I think we can envision now two very different futures. So we know that that money is going to be increasingly digital. Before we continue, help us clicking that YouTube like button and subscribe now to our channel. This shows the algorithm that you valued this information. And it helps us spread that message. Sharing is caring. And now, let's continue. Uh, more so than already is. Right now, it's we think of it as digital. People joke and they're like, well, the dollar's already digital. It's like, well, it also runs on those very old pipes, for lack of a better word. There's this old legacy infrastructure 
And then, you know, we we interact with it in a digital way, but it still goes through these centralized pipes. And, and stable coins are quite different ways to transmit value. And so, obviously, money's going more digital, and it becomes, is it going to be more state and surveillance controlled, right? So, almost like using Satoshi's invention against him, where this technology can enable CBDCs, it can enable, like, uh, essentially highly regulated private stable coins that might as well be CBDCs. For example, they can blacklist any any addresses they want. They can block transactions. You have that approach. Um, or you have Bitcoin, where it's kind of a defense against you know nations that are maybe being improper. And it's one of those things where if you if you're in developed market, it, it, it can sound almost anarch like like you're like you're an anarchist, for example, if you're like you want to t- separate money from state. Um, but it's it's not easy, it's not hard to envision it if you live in Russia or you live in China or you live in Nigeria, for example, right? There's been there's been cases that have been, I think, at this point, well documented by the media where, for example, Putin's opposition that is heavily repressed begins using Bitcoin uh, because they can keep their payment, they can get donations, they can they can send payments. You see it happening in Nigeria where these protest groups pop up, they, you know, they're protesting police violence. Um, and then their bank accounts get frozen, uh, and they can resort to Bitcoin. Um, and so, you know, there's been analysis showing, I think, from Freedom House, showing that over the past 10, 15 years, the world's becoming slightly more authoritarian uh, around the margins. We had this period from, say, the 80s, 90s, we started entering this period of, of liberalization. We had a declining authoritarianism, but now it's on the rise again. And I think also that the pandemic showed that even in developed markets, we have we brought up all these new debates about human rights and, and restrictions on mobility and and things like that. And so in that type of world where technology can increasingly be used to surveil and control populations, that there's this technology that can actually also enable them. And I think we can envision two different futures depending on which path ends up winning. Well, centralized versus decentralized. We uh, actually released a show today for, uh, that I recorded with Mark Moss title will seem hyperbolic but it was uh bitcoin the f- what was it the fate for the future of humanity or the fight for the future of humanity um where it's, it's essentially a world that's becoming more centralized the only way to fight back against that is decentralization and therefore what is the best tool we have well it is bitcoin and, and I, it sounds hyperbolic and i, I think for some people who aren't even the world of bitcoin they think this is absurd but it might be right i think what people miss is that history goes through these big cycles these big pendulum swings yep. And people naturally have recency bias. Where they look over the past 30, 40 years, and they can't envision the world being any different. Whereas that 30 and 40 year period looks crazy compared to people in the in the prior 30 or 40 year period. Yep. It happens with, for example, wage uh, like laborers and capital. You, you see this political shift back and forth between who has more of the power. You know, sometimes you hit an extreme, you have a revolution, or you just kind of you know have a, a, a kind of a partial revolution and, and have like a, a popular swing back. So there's that there's that that keeps changing. As we talked about, these monetary systems keep changing. So you go from gold standard to failed gold standard to Bretton Woods to petrodollar system. You go through these these changes over time. And so right now we've been in this kind of period of increasing centralization, increasing digital uh, digitization. And if you go back to, for example, sci-fi writers, they've been kind of forecasting this, talking about that the more technology exists, the more it enables governments to have kind of a almost a perfect authoritarianism. Like imagine Soviet Russia if they had the surveillance that is able that you have today, including financial surveillance and surveillance blocking. Right? That's essentially what you're what you're what China is kind of moving towards in some ways. And so I think if people think internationally, some of those things seem less crazy. Even if their local country might be benign uh, in the relative sense, I think it's one of those things where you can. You can like government, but still view that well, at the end of the day, the government should be more afraid of the people than the people are f- afraid of the government, right? So it's always good to have that tool that kind of keeps powers in check to avoid that kind of you know absolute power, the ability to stop transactions, block anything, surveil anything, and then there's no checks anymore. Do you want to know one thing about crypto? I made over 3,000% in profit in a few weeks. Fact is, the traditional financial system, the traditional money system makes you poor, not rich. If you want to earn $500,000, million, you have to wait until you're 50, 60, 70 in the traditional financial system and you probably will still be broke. 
and you will be old. This is not a sexy combination, as you can imagine. But the question is, how can you start in crypto and make these profits? Where to invest? Where to start? My name is Gunnar and I'm from Germany, as you can hear, and things are a little bit different in Germany. More about that later on. The fact is, there are lots of different cryptocurrencies. It's a gigantic universe where beginners and professionals get easily lost. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. There are seven key steps you need to follow to become successful in this market. You have to know them and if you fail one of them, it's literally impossible to succeed in this market. Just an example, one of the key points is your exchange and one of the biggest are for example Binance and Coinbase. These are trusted and well established exchanges but, and this is a big but, you won't find the super profitable coins on those exchanges. The unknown super profitable coins that get gigantic profits are not traded on those kind of exchanges. They are traded on much smaller insider platforms that are barely known. And I can tell you what those super secret exchanges are and why they are so profitable. And another super important thing are the right information sources. The point is, the internet is gigantic. There are hundreds and hundreds of YouTube channels, blogs, pages and much, much more. And there are also market makers and influencers. For example, Elon Musk, he is not a crypto guy. But the moment he recommended Dogecoin, it went through the roof, to the moon so to say. But why did he recommend it? Where did he hear it from? He didn't hear it from newspapers. And believe me, he is listening to someone. But you have to know who and you have to react before he is reacting. This is really, really important. And these are only two of the seven steps you have to follow in order to be successful in crypto. And if you want to know all of these steps in much more detail, and if you want to have a comprehensive checklist, here's what you should do. There is a link below this video. Click on this link and you will get the opportunity to subscribe to my channel. Click on the link and you will see a video where I explain the next steps. So see you soon. Click on the link now. I'll see you there.